Hello, I'm Dr. Sandra Freyhofer. Welcome to Medicine Matters. The topic, an August 2025 update on where we are with COVID vaccines. Here's why it matters. The future of COVID vaccines for fall can be best described as unclear. There's confusion, conflict of interest, and chaos. A lot has happened. Back in May, FDA announced the new COVID vaccine formula, a monovalent JN1 lineage, preferably using the LP8.1 strain. FDA fully licensed the Novavax COVID vaccine, but limited its use for those 65 and older and for those aged 12 to 64 years with at least one high-risk medical conditions. The same restrictions were later applied to approval of Moderna's new lower-dose mRNA COVID vaccine, Mnexpike. Then, on May 20th, in a sounding board article in the New England Journal of Medicine, Dr. Vinay Prasad, new head of CBER, and Dr. Marty McCary, FDA's newly appointed commissioner, announced new changes on how FDA would evaluate COVID vaccines. Additional clinical trials, including placebo control trials using a saline placebo, would be required. They said FDA anticipates it will make favorable risk-benefit findings for adults 65 and older and for those six months and older with one or more risk factors that put them at high risk for severe COVID outcomes. Pregnancy was on their high risk list. Then on Tuesday, May 27, HHS Secretary Kennedy issued his own directive and unilaterally removed COVID vaccines from the immunization schedule for healthy children and for pregnant women. He made this announcement on social media on X. No new evidence was cited to support this decision. Absent was anyone from CDC or ACIP. Now understand rates of COVID hospitalizations for children are highest for those under two years old. Babies under six months old are too young to be vaccinated. They're at highest risk. Maternal vaccination can lower that risk. Also remember, Previously healthy children without high-risk conditions have died from COVID. This really hits home for me because I have two grandbabies on the way. Both are due in November. Kennedy's actions triggered the resignation of several key and well-respected CDC employees in the COVID vaccine space. I've served on ACIP's COVID vaccine work group since the beginning. Our work group had not been consulted. In fact, Workgroup meetings had been suspended. Updated COVID vaccine recommendations had been expected to be on the June ACIP meeting agenda. But on June 9th, just two weeks prior to the June meeting, HHS Secretary Kennedy removed all 17 ACIP members, then replaced them with his own hand-picked group of eight, many of whom have preconceived bias against vaccines. At the June meeting, there was also not a vote on COVID vaccines. However, CDC staff did present updates on COVID epidemiology. Most pediatric COVID hospitalizations occur in children under two years old. Most hospitalized children in these age groups have no underlying medical conditions. Rates of COVID-associated hospitalizations are highest among infants under six months old followed by those ages six to 23 months. None of the COVID vaccine products are approved for infants under six months old. These babies depend on maternal vaccination to protect them. The majority of children hospitalized with COVID had not received a dose of the updated vaccine. This data shows why Kennedy's directive to withhold COVID vaccines from children and pregnant women is so absolutely ridiculous. The confusion and misinformation continues. On June 25th, FDA required a label change for COVID vaccines, warning about risk of myocarditis, but did not mention the risk of myocarditis from COVID infection is greater than the risk of myocarditis after COVID vaccination. Then on July 9th, there were more restrictions for COVID vaccines for young children, 
Moderna's mRNA COVID vaccine, Spikevax, was FDA approved for everyone 65 and older, but only for those aged six months to 64 years old with at least one medical condition that put them at increased risk for COVID. Then on August 11th, news reports said, Pfizer's COVID vaccine may lose its emergency use authorization for healthy children under the age of five, although it was expected to be available for children aged five to 11. No official announcement has been made. But understand, if FDA doesn't renew Pfizer's authorization for children six months through four years old or fully approve the vaccine, healthy children in that age group will have no officially sanctioned option for COVID vaccination. The only way to give it to healthy children would be to give the Moderna vaccines off-label. And if that happens, we could end up having a vaccine shortage. COVID hasn't gone away. CDC's wastewater analysis indicates a late summer COVID wave. On August 19th, the Vaccine Integrity Project released From Data to Decisions, the evidence base for the 2025 fall winter immunizations. This live stream presentation looked at recently published and publicly available data and found no notable safety or effectiveness issues. Also on August 19th, AAP, the American Academy of Pediatrics, issued their own evidence-based immunization schedule for children. For COVID protection, AAP recommends COVID vaccine for infants and children six months through 23 months of age, recognizing children in this age group are at highest risk for severe COVID. AAP also recommends a single dose of age-appropriate COVID vaccine for all children and adolescents aged 2 through 18 years in the following risk groups children at high risk of severe COVID, residents of long-term care facilities or other congregate settings, children who've never been vaccinated against COVID, and children with household contacts at high risk for severe COVID disease. AAP also recommends COVID vaccine be available for children ages 2 to 18 who do not fall in these risk groups, but whose parent or guardian desires them to have the protection of the vaccine. AAP recommends the most updated version of the COVID-19 vaccine available should be used. We can expect more medical organizations to issue their recommendations based on this new Vaccine Integrity Project review. Another ACIP meeting is planned for August, September, but with no date certain. We can only hope there will be a truly evidence-based vote on the new formula COVID vaccines, but I'm not optimistic. On July 31st, HHS Secretary Kennedy removed ACIP liaisons from vaccine work groups. These work groups review vaccine data and develop recommendations that are then presented to ACIP at the public meetings for vote. So now the work groups are populated only with Kennedy's new ACIP members, most of whom have a proven history of bias against vaccines, and with CDC staff that could be fired by Kennedy if they don't do what he says. Without liaisons and work groups, we have no way of ensuring that evidence-based science is being applied as work group recommendations are developed and presented to the full ACIP. And there's more. On August 5th, Kennedy cut a half billion dollars in research funding aimed at developing better mRNA vaccines. 22 research grants for COVID and flu vaccines were targeted The reason he gave was that these vaccines made using this platform were not effective and were unsafe. That's not true. The head of the NIH offered another explanation for the cancellation. He said the platform wasn't viable because the public doesn't trust it. These cancellations leave us highly vulnerable for the next pandemic, and there will eventually be one. It also puts development of life-saving mRNA-based cancer treatments at risk. On Friday, August 8th, a shooter unleashed nearly 500 rounds. About 200 of them hit six CDC buildings in Atlanta. One security officer was killed. The shooter died of a self-inflicted gunshot wound. Authorities found documents in his house expressing discontent with COVID vaccines. 
Susan Monarez, the new CDC director, was quoted in the news reports as saying, we know that misinformation can be dangerous. And as we also know, Kennedy has been most prominent in spreading misinformation and voicing distrust of vaccines even long before he became HHS secretary. The case against mRNA technology offered by Kennedy and his new team is unbound by science or evidence. The attack on mRNA vaccines, its unscientific foolishness, perpetuated by people with a bias against vaccines. They use scientific words in a most unscientific way to create misinformation, vaccine hesitancy, confusion, and mistrust. The recent shooting at CDC is an example of mistrust fueled by vaccine skeptics. It was mRNA vaccines developed in one year through Operation Warp Speed that saved the world during the COVID pandemic. Billions of doses of mRNA COVID vaccines have been administered worldwide, making them among the most studied vaccines in history. mRNA vaccines are safe and effective, no other vaccine platform can produce vaccines so quickly. HHS Secretary Kennedy's assault on the viability of ACIP and the destruction of our vaccine development infrastructure continues. We still don't have any ACIP recommendations for updated COVID vaccines for fall. We still don't have a date set for the August-September ACIP meeting. And when that meeting date is set, will a vote on COVID vaccines be on the agenda? The CDC and the HHS secretary are supposed to put forward vaccine policy that can bring health and happiness and prevent death and illness in our country. America's physicians must stand up for our patients, as should everyone who believes in public health. We must push back on misinformation, medical foolishness, and quackery. And what I have just described is exactly that. Misinformation leads to mistrust in vaccines. Mistrust reduces vaccine uptake. And reduced vaccine uptake kills and sickens our patients. For Medicine Matters, I'm Dr. Sandra Freihofer.